Hello, Yawning Angel here, and this is my BBC Master 128. And this is a 6502 second processor unit for the BBC. Now I wanted this processor for a specific reason, and that reason will become clear towards the end of the video. So keep watching. So I managed to get this unit off of eBay for a good price, but when it arrived... It was obvious that it hadn't been packaged properly. It arrived in a few layers of bubble wrap, wrapped up with parcel tape with an address label stuck to it. As I slowly removed the layers of bubble wrap, worried that the unit was damaged in some way because it hadn't arrived in a box, I noticed there was moisture between each layer of bubble wrap, and as I got to the actual unit itself, sure enough, the unit was wet. You can see the moisture on the outer casing from these photos. I didn't get any video of the unboxing because I didn't think I'd need to, but as you can see, moisture is quite clearly evident on the outer case of the unit. It was at this point that I was quite concerned. So I got the unit apart carefully and let it dry out at room temperature for a couple of days. So I needed to see if this second processor unit worked. It wasn't just a case of plugging it in and waiting for a beep or an LED to come to life on the unit to tell me that it was functioning. I needed to connect it to the BBC Master in order to see if the Master would recognise it and if it was actually functioning. But in order to do that, the BBC Master needed an, a DNFS ROM fitted that would enable communication between the Master and the second processor unit. My Master does not have that ROM. So I put a shout out to the community to see if anyone could supply me with one or even point me in the right direction so I can actually get one for myself. And yes, I know I've got this resting behind my spectrum, but it's part of the story, so stick with it. So having put that shout out, it wasn't long before... A package arrived from the amazing Andy of YouTube channel Hack Build Restore. Yes, Andy managed to burn a DNFS ROM for me and sent it over in a package along with some other surprises. Aside from some rather natty purple cable ties, the package contained two ROMs which Andy had managed to burn for me and uh, as you'll probably notice these were packaged up significantly better than the 6502 processor was, that's for sure. Accompanying the ROMs in the package were some amazing HBR stickers, always love a sticker do I, um, and of course the ROMs themselves and I was in for a bit of a surprise because Andy had included along with the DNFS ROM the speech ROM as well for the BBC. This was awesome. Thanks a lot Andy, I really appreciate it and I do recommend that you do go and check out Andy's channel, it's pretty cool. And this is my BBC Master. Here it is in its so ready uh, dust jacket, which does a great job of protecting it. Love the logo on that. Um, so as you can see, the machine is incredibly clean. It's very well looked after. Those who have seen uh, earlier videos of this where I explain how I got it will understand why it is so clean and a, such a pristine example very tidy. Obviously it's an end of line model, hence the keycaps are different on this compared to the earlier versions of the BBC Master. The task then in hand is to get the DNFS ROM fitted inside the machine. This is the ROM which Andy has sent me, so I need to get the machine apart, which is just a case of flipping the machine over and undoing four screws from the underside, which are labelled with the word fix. Uh, we get those out and the case just comes apart. Such a great design, so so easy to get inside the machine to make upgrades and administer any repairs which are needed. A dead easy job, so let's get that done now. With the screws out and the machine flipped over, we can get the top of the case off. But first of all, it's just worth remembering we have four screws. We have two long ones which go at the back 
and two shorter ones at the front. And that's all that's holding this machine together. Fantastic. There don't even appear to be any clips holding the case on. So we can just lift that case straight off. Look at this, it just lifts straight up, nothing else connected to it, and it exposes the inside of the machine, which is beautifully laid out. Very, very clean design in here. And of course, the inside of the machine is very clean too, given uh, the circumstances by which I came by it. Oh, hang on, there's a label here. It looks like someone's been in here already. Of course, Mr. More Fun Making It's Lee has been in here because he very kindly replaced the CMOS battery for me when I sent him this machine to check over before I started using it. So thanks, Lee. That's a great job. As you can see, the inside of the machine, very clean. Uh, there's an empty ROM slot here over on the right, just above the BBC MFMS uh, ROM chip, and that's where we're going to put the DNFS ROM. But as you can see, this motherboard is exceptionally clean. It's shiny and new almost, isn't it? Taking a look here, you can see that the keyboard, it's a Cherry keyboard, so it's not a mechanical keyboard, but it, it's a Cherry keyboard. I know some, pe some people have asked about the keyboard in the past, and uh, well, here it is, proof it's a Cherry keyboard. All good. Right, this is where we're gonna fit the ROM in that empty socket. So it's just a case of uh, picking the ROM up, and pushing it in there, making note that the notch on the end of the ROM is facing to the left of the motherboard, so it lines up with the other ROMs. That is the correct way to put it in. However, I needed to squeeze the legs together on this because uh, it looked like the, the ROM uh, chip had actually been riding a horse uh, before it got here. So um, I just need to squeeze those together in order to get that ROM to fit in there nice and snugly. <laughs> Next up, we just put the top of the case back on. We're not gonna fit any of the screws because we're just gonna test this now. And if we need to get back in here, I don't wanna be undoing screws again. So we're just gonna pop the case on and go and test it and see if it works. With the DNFS ROM fitted, firing up the master and executing the star ROMs command, the master could not see this new ROM. I then fitted the speech ROM in the spare socket and did the same process, executed star ROMs, and it could see the speech ROM perfectly. So did this point to a faulty DNFS ROM? So despite fitting this ROM and setting the jumpers correctly, it would appear that this DNFS ROM had failed. It wasn't working, which was a shame. So I got in touch with Andy and he said he'd send me another one. Cheers, Andy. A quick note about these jumpers. You're gonna to need to move this one and this one down here to the right in order for these two ROM sockets to be recognized by the BBC Master, otherwise it will just ignore them. So don't forget to move them over like I did the first time. So after determining that this ROM did not work, we're gonna swap it out for a new one, which Andy has kindly sent me. I must say that Andy definitely knows how to securely package stuff for transit. Look at this. Brilliant stuff. And here it is, the new DNFS ROM. So as with the ROM last time, it's just a case of fitting it into that socket, making sure that the notch on the left-hand side of the chip is facing to the left of the machine, and just pop it straight in, dead straightforward, so easy. Right, let's go and see if this works now. Fingers crossed. Now it was time to fire up the BBC Master and see if it powered up, first of all, make sure I'd not broken anything, and then issue the star ROMs command to see if it had actually picked up the DNFS ROM chip which I had fitted. And lo and behold, it had. This was a success. We were in business. Huzzah! Riding high on the success of the DNFS ROM working, I then fitted the speech ROM which Andy had sent me, because I fancied having a play around with that. But would that work with the DNFS ROM fitted as well? Let's see.
With the speech ROM fitted, it was time to see if it worked by using the star say command. And yes, it works. Let's try some more speech. Knowing that the ROMs worked okay, it was now just a case of putting the machine back together for what I hoped was the final time. Just a case of getting the top cover back on, then flipping the machine over and getting those four screws fitted. Don't forget, the long screws go at the back. And the short screws go up the front. Also, when putting the screws in, a tip that I've learnt from some of Mark Fix's stuff's videos is always turn the screw backwards before you tighten it up. So get a reverse turn on it, feel it click and find the groove, and then screw it in as normal. Basically, older machines with plastics like this, you don't want to be damaging the plastic that the screw is going into. You don't want it to try and cut a new set of threads because over time, that will render the effectiveness of the screws holding the machine together useless. And I really don't want to damage this master because it's such a pristine example of a machine. <laughs> This is the state of things. The BBC Master is powered up and is connected to the second processor. The second processor is not powered up. Basically, I just want to see if the Master can still detect all the ROMs. Everything seems to be okay. There's a little inset there for you of all the ROMs showing nicely because you can't see them on the TV screen that clearly. Um, so now we're ready for a test which will involve powering down the Master and then bringing everything back up so we'll power up the processor, then power up the master, and see what happens. The question now is, will it work? So now we power up the second processor. Next, we power up the BBC master. Note only a single beep, Dude. but look at that on the screen. Acorn Tube, it says. Acorn Tube 6502. It has detected the second processor. We are in business and this is working. But when I power cycled the machine, when the machine came up, I was confronted with this. Just a flashing cursor in the top left of the screen. It was as if the BBC Master had completely forgotten its CMOS settings. It wasn't booting. It wasn't showing me anything or allowing me to get anywhere. Pressing shift break brought up the Acorn Tube 6502 message, but I couldn't type anything in on the prompt. It was like it had completely forgotten everything. Power cycling the machine again, shutting everything down, starting up the second processor, then starting up the master, had no effect at all. I was still confronted with this flashing cursor and nothing else. So what followed was me doing various combinations of shift break, control break, break, uh, just every key combination I could think of to try and get somewhere. And eventually... I got to this active prompt line which would accept keyboard input. So now I could try and find the program which was the reason behind me getting this second processor in the first place. Issuing the star cat command didn't do anything, so I needed to hit shift break again to get back to that command line. What I then wanted to do was switch to the MMFS file system which is where the program I'm looking for resides. First of all, I needed to insert the virtual disk that had that program on it. 
Yes, the second processor version of Elite. Elite 3D brought to us by the incredibly talented Mr. Mark Moxon. I've been after running this version of Elite on my master since I first heard about it. And here's a non-fussy screen version of it. This is some screen capture. And I'm sure you'll agree, this looks incredibly stunning. I must admit, I'm incredibly blown away by this. It looks phenomenal. You do need a set of 3D glasses, but I'll be talking more about this in the next video. So there we have it. I wanted to get this second processor unit in order to get Elite 3D running on this BBC Master. And I've succeeded, and I'm super happy about that. Expect to see my thoughts and views on 3D Elite on the BBC Master in a forthcoming video. And if you don't want to miss that, make sure you subscribe to my channel. I'm still not too sure what caused those random startup issues with the machine not recognising its CMOS settings. Since filming that footage, I've power cycled the machine a number of times, and for the most part it comes up okay. I'm not too sure whether the issues were caused by a dodgy connection somewhere, the ribbon cable not connected to the tube socket efficiently, I really don't know. If anyone has any ideas as to why that might have happened, please leave your thoughts in the comments section down below. Cheers! And that is finally it for this video. Thank you ever so much for watching. I really hope you found it interesting. Whatever you do, take care of yourself and keep it retro.